great to be here and talk about something near and dear to my heart as someone who went through a period of doubts in my, back in the late 90s. I have, was raised a Christian, but I went through a, a really tough period of just wondering, you know, is all this true? There's so many smart scientists that don't believe anything. It was real, really hard for me to kind of get through that phase. But one of the things that helped me a lot was going back and looking at some of the evidence. Um, and I have a physics degree, and so I looked a lot at the fine-tuning evidence and some things from cosmology that we'll talk about today. And it really helped me get through that as well as many other things, looking at other evidence in different areas. But um, I find this to be very compelling. And I've done a, done a lot of research and study in this area. Last year, about this time, we brought an astrophysicist named Luke Barnes in from Australia to give some talks. And really, he went all across the uh, US on kind of a book tour for his Cambridge University Press book in which he made the case for God from the fine tuning. And we set up a debate here locally with one of the UTD profs where I, I lead a reasonable faith chapter. And that went really well. And uh, the interesting thing about that book, though, is that in it, he, he co-authored it with an atheist a colleague, and they both agree, except for one footnote, on all the science, but uh, they come obviously to different conclusions about how to interpret the data. And Luke makes a case for God, and we can discuss later. We'll get into wh where the other guy went with it. So uh, we'll jump right in here. I've entitled it Cosmic Coincidences, Evidence for God from Science. So we're going to look at a number of things that you know, the, if superficially at least, the, maybe they look like they could be coincidences. Is there a deeper meaning behind it? That's what we want to examine. Many of them do relate to fine tuning, which is more in the fundamental physics, but we're also going to look at a few things from biology. I, I like to look really at the foundations of the science. What is the foundation of biology? Well, it's origin of life. That's where biology begins, and that's where I think there's really strong, the strongest evidence for design, I think, is in that particular area. And similarly, for chemistry, it turns out there's a lot of evidence at the very foundational levels. You need to get a lot right to fill out a periodic table. So we're going to get into that. And then obviously at physics, the, if you think about what is really at the foundations of science, well, it all boils down to a series of laws. Then you have some constants within the mathematical equations that describe those laws. And you also maybe have some initial conditions of the universe. And in each of those three areas, there's an extreme degree of fine tuning that makes it look like the universe was rigged for life. And so that's, that's what we're going to really get into here. Uh, I do have a quote here. If you hadn't read it as you were waiting, it's, it's worth taking note of by an agnostic physicist named Paul Davies. He says, the really amazing thing is not that life on Earth is balanced on a knife edge, but that the entire universe is balanced on a knife edge and would be total chaos if any of the natural constants were off even slightly. So th there's some interesting things that get the attention of non-believing scientists. In fact, this whole area of fine tuning was really discovered by people who themselves were not theists. They weren't looking for this kind of evidence. They just stumbled across it. And then the more they looked into it, the more powerful the case that there's something going on here has become. So, you know, let's start off with talking a little bit about coincidences. Um, and I think there's some interesting examples in the history of science where things originally looked like coincidences, but over time, as they saw there's more and more of these, they realized there's some underlying explanation of them. Namely, for example, the theory of continental drift. This is an interesting one in that and it was long, long thought implausible because they didn't have a mechanism. But Alfred Wegener, he proposed this theory way back in 1912 that, hey, maybe the continents drift over time and they were previously connected. And there were noted patterns of fossils going across the continents. The shape of the continents could fit together. There were mineral patterns. There's all these independent lines of evidence that would support the possibility that they at one time were together. But you know, at first blush, it seemed implausible that, well, how can you have these massive continents just kind of drifting? And in a similar way, it's a bit analogous to some people are very skeptical that there could be a supernatural cause of the universe that set up the laws of nature. For some, maybe, maybe not many in this room, 
But for many, they start off assuming that's very, very implausible because they don't know, well, they might have skepticism about miracles and they need to go hear Dr. McGrew <laughs> deal with that issue. But um, yeah, I think this is just a great example because despite the skepticism, eventually they all realized that there was something going on here that had a deeper explanation. And the thing with the fine tuning that's interesting is that you really have reached the bottom of any kind of naturalistic potential explanation. Once you get to the laws, the constants, and the initial conditions, you can't go any more primitive than that on naturalism. And so theism, belief in God, is offering an explanation where there is no naturalistic alternative once you get to that level. And so it's not at all a God of the gaps argument because there's no alternative. It's not a threat to science. It's based on all of our best theories of science. This is not like, oh, we're, you know, this fine tuning is new. We're not sure about it. Give it more time. No, it's based on all of the best accepted theories of science and what that entails as you start looking at possible universes that could have been with different constants. So my claim in this talk will be that there's a number of incredibly unlikely coincidences that are necessary for intelligent life and that theism better explains those coincidences than naturalism because naturalism does end up basically holding out for chance for just getting incredibly lucky as being the best explanation. And these coincidences, I argue, are based on consensus science, well-accepted science that are at the foundations of the major disciplines, physics, chemistry, and biology, as I previously mentioned. So here's the ones just to give you kind of a quick overview of what we'll talk about in more depth. We're going to talk a bit about the origin of the universe, the initial conditions of the universe, the fundamental laws of nature, and then we're going to look at several aspect of how, aspects of how the constants have been finely tuned to support things like long-lived stars, the elements you need for life, the special properties of water, and something called the cosmological constant, which I'll explain in, in detail. Um, and then, so it's not just physics. I think it's interesting to look at other areas of science at the most foundational level and examine what, where the evidence really points in those. And so we'll talk briefly about the origin of life, the origin of most animal phyla in a geologic eye blink, as one scientist put it. And we'll look at the origin of an optimized genetic code that even Richard Dawkins, the fam famous uh, evolutionary biologist who's an atheist, says he agrees that the genetic code can't evolve. So let's start off at the logical place, right? Let's start off with the origin of the universe and look at what is what has science really showed us about that and does that fit better with naturalism or theism? Naturalism, of course, being the theory that nature is all there is. There's nothing supernatural. So I think it's fair to say that most scientists, not all, but most agree that our universe had a beginning. Every time you hear someone say, the universe is so many billion years old or whatever, that's sort of a testament to that. They're saying that, that there was a beginning. Now there's some that would want to say there was things going on before the Big Bang. Maybe there's some natural process that could have produced our universe. So we can, we can talk about that a little bit. But the radical thing actually is that on Einstein's theory of general relativity, that theory really does demand a beginning to not just matter and energy, but actually space and time, okay? Which is very hard to wrap your mind around that you can't, you, you go backwards in time, you reach a point at which there's a first moment and there's nothing physical beyond that. And similarly with space, if you go backwards, it's, it's not that our universe, the matter, it's not just that our uni the matter in our universe is expanding, but it's in some sense space itself is expanding and stretching out the universe. And therefore, I think it's very difficult on naturalism to account for this kind of thing because all the physical resources have been taken away. You need something transcendent to bring about all of space, time, matter, and energy. You need a cause that goes beyond space, matter, and energy. You start getting some of the properties of God. You know, obviously not all of them, not the Christian God, but I find that very significant in evaluating theism against naturalism. All right, let's talk a little bit about, so yeah, there's some theories that maybe something preceded the Big Bang in our universe, maybe some kind of quantum fluctuation. 
But if you, if you study that in detail, you see that they're also relying on a number of different things even to come up with that as even a remotely plausible kind of scenario. For example, it requires a radical interpretation of quantum mechanics. I won't get into that, but we can talk later afterwards if, if you want to hear about that. Um, but in this so-called mini worlds interpretation, well, one, one physicist, I read a book recently where he said, this is the most bizarre description of reality ever seriously proposed and provides a fascinating base for speculation and for science fiction. Okay, so not all, not all scientists are impressed with this interpretation where for every possible quantum event, you have parallel universes branching off. And so it's, you know, we have no evidence for any universe other than ourselves. There's quantum experiments that seem to point to that not be, this not being a valid interpretation as well. But um, for instance, one thing that's interesting about this theory that Alexander Vilenkin, he's a prominent science cosmologist who happens to be an atheist or agnostic, he says on this theory that Elvis is alive in some parallel universe now. And he said there is a universe where Al Gore did become president. He was writing this after the, yeah, the Gore, Bush, close presidential kind of thing. And uh, so there's some interesting implications of these theories that some find very implausible. There's also a number of arguments from within the laws of physics that would seem to preclude the possibility that there's all these other universes that produced ours uh, that would be able to go back eternal to the past. Because that's all that matters, really. God could have created many universes, right? We don't necessarily, there's not a lot of information for or against theism based on just how many universes there are. But the key question is, was there a beginning or not? Once you say there's a beginning, even Stephen Hawking would, would give, would have, he, he was, would admit things like, well, if there's a beginning, then you need a creator of the universe. Uh, so there's, this is, it gets technical, so I'm not gonna get into it, but if you wanna talk to me afterwards, uh, there's something called the generalized second law. It's an extension of the second law of thermodynamics to quantum mechanics that seems to demand a beginning. Uh, a rough way to think about it is uh, like on the second law, you know, if I left, say I have a coffee cup here, and I say that I left, I left it here yesterday, and yet you see steam coming from it, then you would know that that's, that doesn't make sense. It would have cooled off to the temperature of the room. Uh, so there's ways within thermodynamics where you can tell the age of something. So it's, it's somewhat akin to that. But it's interesting that you have magazines, journals, with articles like this. Now, New Scientist was formed to sort of promote Darwinian evolution in some sense, very pro-evolution, but they have a article where it says why physicists can't avoid a creation event. Now, that, that should kind of get your attention for a magazine that devotes a lot of energy into arguing against creationism in various forms, but they admit that there seems to be a need for a beginning to the universe, and it relates a lot to some of the things on the previous slide there that I shared. So I think all in all, there's pretty good evidence from, for there being a creation of the universe, and if there's a creation, then it's plausible to expect a create horror. So now let's switch gears a little bit to fine tuning, which was, I was introducing earlier. And I'll explain a little bit more about that concept so yeah, about 40 years ago, 45 years ago or so, scientists discovered the universe could be thought of as sort of like a biosphere. I don't know, had anybody heard about the one they tried to set up in Arizona? They were trying to set up a self-sustaining environment for life. It's an interesting thing because if you could do that, then you could set one up on another planet and you wouldn't need special atmospheric conditions and all that. However, it turned out to be much harder than they thought just to have kind of a a good environment where life could flourish and or just stay alive even. So it failed after a couple of years. It was, it was a bit challenging. And I don't doubt that they could eventually establish that. But the point is, there, you know, in order to get a biosphere, you have to have certain things right. In order to have a universe for life, you've got to have certain things that would support that. And we, there's a lot more that could be said for that. But you need things like stable structures, for example, um, I think it's, there's some really good argument based on John von Neumann and his work on cellular automata that point to the need for, if you're gonna have any kind of structure that can replicate itself, which is a prerequisite for life, you're going to need uh, 
uh, the ability to store information and replicate it. And that's why, for example, no scientist really thinks that you can have radiation-based life forms. So the, the rays emanating from stars, those are not going to be able to be a plausible way for life to exist because you can't, you can't really store information and replicate it just with rays of light. That's kind of an example. All right, so that's called the fine tuning. Another way to think of it is to think of a, this is from a nuclear reactor here, but uh, you can think of the universe as being controlled by knobs that affect the strength of the various forces like gravity or the masses of various particles like the proton, neutron, or electron or the constituents of those. And what scientists have surprisingly discovered is that tiny, tiny changes to those among the range of possibilities would have made it impossible for life really anywhere in the universe. Now some of them, it might, you know, you could just say maybe it's life as we know it, but for many of them, for the core, there's enough of a core strong argument to be made there that you can safely say no form of life anywhere in the universe could not exist without extreme fine tuning. And yeah, Luke Barnes, the astrophysicist I mentioned earlier, has kind of helped to tutor me in that area and he has a number of peer-reviewed papers and review articles, and in, in those he, he makes this claim, which I think is very well established, even by those who would not believe in God or anything like that, simply that in the set of possible physical laws, parameters and initial conditions, the subset that permit life is very small. And I, I kind of like to insert the word intelligent because I think however hard it is to get life, it's even harder to get interesting life, like intelligent life forms like humans, right? Okay, now this isn't dealing specifically with humans. The fine tuning is much more broad than that. And the scientists who are examining it, they have very broad expectations of what evolution could or couldn't do. They trust the biologists that evolution could do all kinds of things. But they're looking at the question of what could happen before you even get the first life form. So that's an interesting thing about the fine-tuning argument is it completely undercuts evolution as an argument against God because before evolution could even start, you've got to get all these things right in the universe. And so I think it's an interesting area to examine in more detail. It's something you can discuss with people without the emotional kinds of issues that often come up in that area where people tend to be very dismissive uh, when you question evolution at all. So let's look at some examples. I think a logical place, again, to start here would be at the very beginning. And there's some quite impressive examples of fine tuning in the initial conditions coming out of the Big Bang. So you know, even the term Big Bang, it kind of sounds uh, like an explosion, doesn't it? And in fact, Fred Hoyle came up with this term as kind of a derogatory term. He's like, he didn't like this theory because of really of the, the theistic implications. It looked a lot like a creation event there was a lot of initial resistance to the Big Bang as a theory. And so he, he, you know, he would just call it this Big Bang. You know, it, made, it does kind of create in your mind a picture that's like an explosion, which an explosion is very chaotic, right? But the interesting thing is it turns out that it, you really need some exquisite level of fine tuning. It can't just be a random way things started out if you want life. Nearly all initial conditions of the, coming out of the Big Bang would have resulted in lifeless universes that would have been either just basically the whole universe would have been like one black hole or a number of large ones. It would have been so dominated by black holes no life would be possible. So Roger Penrose I think is the first one that made physicists aware of this and I, I haven't really seen this disputed despite attempts to find anybody that would try to disagree with this. But he, he put the odds, this one's really mind-boggling, he put the odds against life if you're, he said, you know, if you're randomly setting up the particle locations early coming out of the universe, um, the odds of getting a life permitting one would be 1 in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. So notice there's two levels of exponents here. So if you were to write that number out in normal standard ordinal form, it would have more zeros than there are particles in the universe, subatomic particles in the universe. So that is a really big number. All right, so, you know, if you, if you doubted before, maybe there's a little bit of amb ambiguity. Physicists are always trying to make the universe eternal. Uh, 
coming up with speculative theories. Maybe there's a chance of them to do that. But when you look at how special the initial conditions were of our universe, I think that should be sort of the tiebreaker. If it's in any doubt in your mind whether this was something that a supernatural creator did or not, I think that should be persuasive. All right, we can also look at the level of laws of nature. Um, it turns out that you need all kinds of things to be right just in the fundamental laws of nature. For example, if there's no quantum mechanics, you would have no stable atoms. Uh, without something called the Pauli exclusion principle, there would be no chemistry possible. All the electrons would be in the lowest energy level. You wouldn't have the ability to form molecules interesting molecules and things like that. If gravity were repulsive rather than attractive, matter could clump, would not clump into complex structures. And by the way, I can make all these slides available. So if you're, there's a lot of information coming out quickly here, but I can give you a copy of the slides. So you know, in, in our universe, it, it's very spread out, all the matter. Your density is actually 10 to the 30th times greater than average. So again, yeah, when you see an exponent like that, just think of one with that many zeros after it, one with 30 zeros after it, so huge number. Uh, yeah, let me just move on here for the sake of time, but there's actually at least 24 of these kind of qualitative cases. So even if you just say, well, maybe there's a half chance, you know, you could get lucky as kind of a half chance kind of thing. When you put them together, it's still like one and two to the 24th power which is basically about like the odds of winning the lottery, something of that nature, depending on the lottery. So that's at the level of the laws, and that's really somewhat modest. You know, that might not be enough to convince a hardcore physicist that uh, there's something rigged there. But what's really got their attention are the constants of nature. The constants within the laws require fine tuning, and physicists do those who have studied this, at least in detail, seem to uh, basically all agree, with one or two exceptions, that nearly all universes with constants chosen at random would be lifeless. All right, and so this was the cover picture of the book that I referenced earlier, and it's kind of trying to show just this huge number of black universes here, and you know, you have one that's got these special properties that could permit life, but the vast, vast majority would be completely lifeless. So it turns out there's about 20 or so different constants that each have to be finely tuned to support life. And I've already kind of mentioned at a high level some aspects concerning that in terms of the particle masses and forces. There's many other parameters that you might not, might not expect. You know, why, why would it matter how strong the quantum effects are, the speed of light, or things like that? But it turns out if you start changing the speed of light, that can really wreck things for life in the universe. One of the things I find especially compelling is that most of these parameters have to be finely tuned, not just in one way, but in many times a half dozen or so, maybe as many as 10 different ways based on independent life permitting criteria. And so it begins to look rigged at multiple levels. And this is exactly the kind of thing that could not be explained by a multiverse. So even if there's all these other universes and they have randomly varying laws and constants or something of that nature, you still end up with coincidences like this that don't seem to fit well within that. All right, a good example of fine tuning of the constants is star longevity. Life needs a, some kind of stable long-term energy source if you're to have life in the universe, it's got to have a source of energy to drive the chemical reactions you need for life, to overcome the second law of thermodynamics, things like that. So let's think a little bit about what a star is. A star is basically a nuclear bomb that's held together by gravity. I don't know if you ever really thought about that, but it's got these nuclear reactions going on there, and it's got, of course, enormous gravity because of its size. And it maintains this kind of equilibrium that's very stable. Obviously, we're, we're concerned about things like global warming. And uh, one component of that seems to be human-induced. And another component that we need to monitor carefully is the variation of the intensity of the radiation coming from our star, the sun. And 
that's been a source of significant change in the past. Uh, but thankfully, we live around a star that's incredibly stable. There's something real interesting going on just to be able to permit the kind of stable, consistent energy levels coming out of a star. But in particular, what's surprising is the, uh, the duration at which it could do these kind of nuclear reactions. So I encourage you to think about the contrast with a human-induced nuclear bomb, basically, explosion. It goes incredibly fast, right? We're talking like nanoseconds, and boom, it's done. How is it that the star is undergoing nuclear reactions and lasting 10 billion years, something of that nature? Uh, and one way to think about it and appreciate the need for fine tuning as well is to think about the energy output of the sun per unit mass. Okay, so uh, what do you think? If you, if you were to compute, you know, each of our bodies here, we're warmer than the environment here, we're putting out energy, we're doing metabolism, and so there's a certain energy output from each, each of our bodies here. That's why a packed room gets warm. Uh, how does that compare to the energy output of the sun? You guys ever thought about that or heard any, anything about that? Okay, it turns out that the sun outputs roughly about one one thousandth of the energy level that you do per unit mass. Now that's a very significant caveat because the sun is incredibly larger than a person or an earth or anything like that, obviously. So the sun puts out an enormous amount of energy and yet the energy per mass turns out to be actually less than a human. So that tells you something is going on that's interesting here. And so I think you could see that, yeah, that might need a little fine tuning. If you just randomly set up nuclear explosions, they may not last for 10 billion years. So I think this is a good example that people can wrap their heads around even if you haven't studied much science. So the things that end up having to be finely tuned to produce this include uh, the electromagnetic repulsion of proteins being finely matched to the gravitational strength. Um, it turns out it takes about 40,000 years for photons emitted in the sun's interior to escape its surface. Uh, so there's some really interesting things going on there uh, in this kind of plasma of the sun that slow down the energy rate. The relative strength of three different forces needs to be finely tuned to slow this. It turns out also you can mess this up if you change the masses of fundamental particles or derived particles like the neutron, proton, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways to get this wrong, and it's, it's difficult to get right. Um, roughly, some of these come out to about one part in 10 to the 35th power. So there's multiple fine tunings to that degree or more finely tuned than that, just related to the longevity, having long-lived stars, which would seem to be a prerequisite for life. And so I like to try to give an analogy here because that's, you know, that's a big number. It's hard to really think about, well, how, how, what does that mean? One in 10 to the 35th power. So I computed, well, how many grains of sand would it take to build, you know, what would 10 to the 35th grains of sand look like? Because that's about the smallest thing we can get our minds around. Most of us can't really visualize how many atoms there are in, our, in a room or something, but we know, we know grains of sand. So um, I pictured taking all of Euro Europe and Asia. We know those, you know, that's a lot of area. Picture maybe like a 2D area of that, uh, that, that amount of area, and then just vertical walls of sand. You know, you couldn't build a sand pile that was purely vertical, but as a thought experiment, and just thinking about how many grains of sand, you can maybe kind of roughly see that that's a lot of sand if you start filling up the whole continent of Asia and Europe and going upwards. And it turns out you'd have to go upwards to the height of the moon to get the 10 to the 35th sand. So then you can think about the analogy of, I'm gonna paint one of those grains red, mix it up, blindfold someone, have them choose at random. What are the odds they get the red grain of sand in one choice? Doesn't seem real probable, does it? Chance is not a real good explanation for that. And it turns out, actually, you'd have to go about five times larger. You need more, that, that this is off still by a factor of five. So you go to the moon and go five times higher. So that really gets your attention. So you might be thinking, well, how do I know, you know I can trust this, this guy at the front here? Here's a um, well-respected physicist, Lee Smolin, PhD from Harvard, and he looks at something, he, 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 the way he phrases it, it's not just long-lived stars, but he, he's saying stars at all here, 
And the number he computes is about one chance in 10 to the 229th power. Okay, so I'm, I'm being, you know, pretty conservative here, as Luke Barnes is, and we try to just be safe in making these claims to go with what more conservative physicists would go with, but that gives you an idea that, yeah, even non-believing scientists of some stature will say things like this or even more fine-tuned. So yeah, this would be like doing it like six or seven times, that same red grain sand experiment. All right, it turns out also you need fine tuning in order to get elements useful for life. Um, carbon is incredibly well suited for life. Oxygen is, is an ideal element for harnessing energy and it also is important obviously for water, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it turns out there, you would not have been able to have both carbon and oxygen in the universe had it not been for a series of three coincidences in which certain forces had to be fine-tuned to within one, about one part in 200 of their strength. So you, when you say the electromagnetic force is fine-tuned to one part in 200, well, it, it could have actually been a thousand times stronger as well. So it's almost a little bit misleading to just think of it as a one in 200 chance. It's really more like a one in 200,000 chance. And so you have three different coincidences of this type. You can also look at the charge of the electron. If that's off just a little bit, it messes up the nuclear fusion reactions that produce carbon and oxygen. And uh, these are the kind of things that led Fred Hoyle, again, he was not a believer, and he probably should have won the Nobel Prize, most people think, for his work in making predictions about certain aspects related to this very thing, actually, about how you produce carbon in stars. And he, he basically came to the conclusion there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. He, he sensed something going on here that he attributed to some kind of intelligence. He started to kind of move away from his atheism. I don't, he never became like a Christian or a believer. He was always looking for ways to go against that, but he was somewhat honest with some of the things he was seeing. So is carbon really that big of a deal, though? Is it really that special? Here's an interesting slide that Luke Barnes and his atheist colleague put together in their book. I put it in graphical form here, but um, it's reference to some work by chemists. But basically, it shows here different elements, um, silicon, nitrogen. These are the elements toward the bottom or at the top of the periodic table. And it shows the number of compounds they can form with carbon. So you see things in the order of 60 and 30 and so forth. So what about carbon? Well, carbon has 29,000 different compounds that can form with hydrogen. So it, it does kind of stand out on this just a little bit, doesn't it? I didn't want to try to draw that graph. It, you could think of, at this, at this screen, I mean, it'd probably be almost a mile out, I think, if we were to show the carbon on here <laughs> relative to that. So pretty significant. I did the computations for a 38 inch TV and it was a quarter of a mile and I would say this, maybe a half mile we could safely say. So anyway, what about oxygen? We can look just with respect to water. Uh, obviously oxygen is a component in water and there's some really interesting things going on related to water and some properties that it has that are especially helpful for life. Um, and they recently, and this is an example of the fact that scientists continue to seem to discover new examples of fine tuning and the number of fine tuning claims is growing over time. Uh, occasionally, in fact, Luke Barnes himself has found something and tried to push it the other direction. So he's trying to be super careful to only make claims that will stand up. Uh, but anyway, in 20, 2011, fairly recently, they discovered that um, without a fortuitous but incredibly balanced uh, set of things happening related to quantum forces, you would not have the properties of water. Water is one of the planet's weirdest liquids and many of its most bizarre features are what make it life-giving. So it's interesting because this relates to the strength of the quantum effects, which is also something that if you start changing, you can mess up other things. So again, the fact that there's all these independent constraints on a given parameter argues for it looking rigged in multiple ways. Now, there's a lot that could be said for water. I've got 
multiple slides I'm not showing here with even, even more packed with information. And I think I'm going to go through this really quickly. But basically, the fact that ice floats uh, prevents uh, lakes from freezing bottom up. And then you have ice acting as a special insulator. Water has a high heat capacity, which means it's really good at moderating temperatures, both at the organismal level and at the level of a planet. And it's got a uh, latent heat of evaporation uh, far better than other substances. So it's, it's really well suited for us here in Texas where you want evaporative cooling is really the only way to cool your body down in the hot summers. And uh, when we sweat, it works incredibly well. So um, basically any other liquid would not work nearly as well at that. All right, uh, other things related to heat transfer, the ability to draw water up into trees, uh, the viscosity is really well set up um, for stable and rapid diffusion. It's a non-Newtonian fluid, which means that it's perfect for pumping blood, uh, where a 2x increase in pressure leads to a 3x rate of blood flow. So there's, all these, there's a lot more that could be said, um, but water is incredibly beneficial now, water is actually one of the ones where all my other examples are more geared towards life of any kind, whereas this water one, yeah, it's maybe, it's not as uh, hard and fast. Maybe you could have life without water. I'm not saying you couldn't. But I include it in here because these multiverse theories would make predictions, if they were true, that among life-permitting universes, ours would be just barely good enough for life. And yet we have all these things like this where it seems better suited for life than it should be. In fact, Roger Penrose, in talking about the initial conditions, he says the multiverse is worse than useless for explaining that fine tuning. So there's a lot of problems with those kind of theories that we just got lucky from all these other universes with randomly varying laws. Uh, and water is one of the things that poses a problem for that. Now here's one that is very firmly established though with respect to life of any kind anywhere in the universe. And it's one in which Luke Barnes has been doing cutting edge, re cutting edge research on this for over a year and just validating what other Nobel Prize winners like atheist Stephen, um, uh, not Stephen Hawking, um, Weinberg down at UT Austin where I studied um, have admitted that this one is, in fact, Weinberg would say it's fine-tuned to about 1 in 10 to the 120th power. So you're looking at more than three of the red grain of sand in a row kind of level of improbability. Luke Barnes puts it more conservatively, and uh, it, he puts it at about 1 in 10 to the 90th, but he's being super conservative. But basically, this is the constant associated with the expansion rate of the universe. If it's too large, the whole universe would just be a thin hydrogen soup where you would not even have the protons hitting each other uh, except on time scales of like a trillion years or something like that. Um, if it was too small, the universe would have rapidly recollapsed before ever cooling below a million degrees. You know, if it, the universe lasts a day and it's 10 million degrees, not a good candidate for producing intelligent life. All right, um, I pretty much covered this. So yeah, Luke Barnes's research also poses problems for the multiverse explanation because it's more fine-tuned than is necessary. It's not just barely fine-tuned. Uh, so I can talk about that more offline if you want the details on that, if that's, if that's confusing or maybe during the Q&A. So in summary, there are many fine-tuning cases to this kind of mind-boggling level. We've seen initial conditions, constants, and <clears throat> you know, I don't expect you to take my word for it. I encourage you to you know, look at some of the articles out there, look at some of the books if you doubt it, but very few physicists studying this have doubted this fine-tuning itself. It's more of the interpretation all right, and here's a good illustration of that fine-tuning of multiple parameters having to be just right. You can picture these different um, life-permitting criteria, and maybe one of them gives you a range where, okay, the mass or the, uh, say, the charge of the electron could be anywhere within this range. Another one, for the purpose of, you know, long-lived stars, that's it. For the purpose of 
well-behaved chemistry, maybe it's over here, uh, things of that nature. Probably the mass, mass would be a better example than charge. Charge doesn't have as many uh, independent constraints. So just one of those would mess up that whole thing is, is the moral of that story. But let's talk briefly about more in the biology realm before we run out of time here. Okay, so what is the foundation of biology? It's origin of life. Let's look at is there a plausible naturalistic account for the origin of life? And I argue, based on my study and looking at what the experts are saying, that there's no remotely plausible scenario yet offered. All right. Um, it's interesting to look at how people have responded to this, that have studied it in detail. People like Antony Flew, the famous atheist, who was very well known as you know, a debater against theists and all this kind of thing. And um, the origin of life played a key role in making him say that he thinks God exists. Um, also, uh, there's an interesting story from down in Houston. Nobel Prize winning chemist Richard Smalley read a book called Origins of Life and concluded that it's clear chemical evolution could not have occurred. He did that at the time that he was an atheist and uh, that led for him to ultimately believe in God and then down the road years later, a couple years later I think, ended up becoming a Christian. So I find that interesting. But let's look at what some of the experts are saying in this area of the origin of life. Here's atheist Eugene Koonin. He says, for biological evolution to take off, you need efficient systems for replication and translation. That means making proteins. But even bare bones cores of these systems appear to be products of extensive selection. So he has some pretty good arguments that the first life would have had to be reasonably advanced in order to evolve so that it could then improve. And again, he's you know, very optimistic about what evolution could do. And so he thinks the first cell was protein based. Others don't necessarily go that route, but they also think that the universe is improbable. Others might put it more like this, one in, one in 10 to the 300th power. So again, that would be like doing you know, maybe eight or so of the red grains in a row <laughs> with one chance. That's, a, that's pretty improbable. Um, Kunin, though, put it at one in 10 to the power of 1,018. Okay, so find that interesting. And then when you look at really top chemists, I think that's a good source. Chemistry is the discipline that would be best suited to determine how hard is it to get the first life form because you're dealing with chemical reactions on early earth, things like that. Dr. Whitesides of Harvard, um, he's the most cited chemist in the world or was at least a couple years ago. And let's see what he has to say about this. So I showed you this before, which is we know how to make a chicken into chicken soup. The question is, can you make chicken soup into chicken? And that's, we don't know how to do that, but it's a little bit even worse than that because it's really this. So suppose you have something of this kind, which is, I think, what many people would argue is the plausible cradle for life. And then you pour the chicken soup into it, and out of it comes something like that. And it seems very hard to understand how that can happen. How do you go from a system that's disordered, dilute, contains all kinds of other stuff, mostly other stuff, how do you go from that spontaneously not only to a more ordered state, but also to a state that has the characteristic that, depending upon how you want to phrase it, it's self-evolving or self-assembling. We know how to do that once you get to life, but we don't know how to do it at the very beginning, and that's the reason. All right, just a brief thing there. So it's, it's even worse than making a chicken from soup, is what he's saying. And he admits we really have no idea how it formed. He's got some good work on something called the chirality problem where you need certain handedness and molecules to form life and he just admits we have no clue how you get what you need for life on the early earth. Another top chemist, he's I think in the top five of, in terms of people citing his publications and so forth, James Tour, he's down at Rice and here's what he says about origin of life. Not sure why we have him dropping off there but Maybe it's just a different volume level. Okay, we have some issue with that one. 
All right, I'll summarize. <laughs> Um, basically, he, he says that uh, he, he goes in, talks to Nobel Prize winners, being a very prominent chemist. He has access to many, you know, he has lots of friends that are top chemists. And he asks them, you know, what do you think? You know, he's really sincerely trying to find what is the best naturalistic explanation. And he, he says they really just, behind closed doors especially, they'll be more candid in admitting that. And he says they, they just have no idea how it could happen. There's no plaus remotely plausible scenario. Paul Davies, also the agnostic physicist who I mentioned earlier, he's in, involved in origins more generally at Arizona State. And he, he's also said similar things, that behind closed doors, they're more, more likely to admit that uh, there's just no plausible scenario. They have no clue how this could happen. OK, so do we just all of a sudden punt to God? Um, I, you know, I, what I would say, though, is that you should take those kinds of things seriously if you're a naturalist, if you're an atheist. We can en encourage our skeptical friends to, to, you know, just have a sincere attitude of searching. And if, um, you know, if, if naturalism is false, you're going to have certain things like this where there just seems to be no explanation for consciousness or origin of life. And that can be very strong evidence or clues, even if you treat it tentatively and are still looking for naturalistic solutions, which I encourage, because that can just make the case stronger. And in fact, in Origin of Life, I think there's some reasons for thinking that over time, we've gained an appreciation for the degree of a difficulty of the problem. It's, it's looked more improbable on naturalism, not less over time, I would argue. You can find that online if you search for James Tour and like Waterloo or something. So sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, let's talk just briefly about something called the Cambrian Explosion, which is the rapid appearance of many, most animal body types um, in a very brief time. Uh, on geologic terms, we could say it was about 540 million years ago or so. So if you take the age of the Earth as 24 hours as an analogy, you basically have this Cambrian explosion happening basically within one minute of the 24-hour time period. So on Darwin's theory, he clearly predicted you know, this kind of branching structure where it should take the longest to come up with changes at the, you know, these foundational levels like body plans. That should take the longest time. Why then is it that you get these nearly all at once? Okay, is there, is there really a plausible mechanism for producing so much new biological change all at once. Richard Dawkins says, we find many already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is as though they were planted there without any evolutionary history. Maybe he's right about that. So even with much higher than current mutation rates, there seems to be no way to account for the origin of so much genetic information so quickly. They even have vertebrates showing up during this time frame, vertebrate fish. All right. And I think an even more compelling, interesting thing to look at, where naturalism seems to be relying on coincidences, is with respect to the genetic code. I think just the fact that, that we have a genetic code at all is something difficult to explain on the basis of random, unguided processes. Um, DNA itself is used solely for informational purposes in the sense that no connection between chemical properties and information content exists. And the fact that when you develop a code, you've got to have sender and receiver in sync from the beginning for it to be meaningful, I think is very difficult to account for by some kind of stepwise evolutionary process where each step has to give you a benefit or at least be neutral to be preserved. And the other examples of codes that we know about do originate from intelligence. There's some interesting things about the genetic code that have been pointed out in the peer-reviewed literature, such as that the choice of bases used is such that it forms a parity code that aids in the ability to detect errors. And uh, one, one author pointed out that it seems to be um, anticipating something called Hamming codes, which relates to error-preserving things that humans use in our codes that we send out. So there's some really interesting things going on with respect to uh, error minimization in the genetic code. It seems to be optimized to minimize errors in the code. Um, 
and I'm going to show you some slides on that in a minute. If there are mistakes, it's set up so that you would get a similar amino acid with similar properties. There's also, if you end up being off in a, what's called a frame shift mutation, if you take the code and you shift it over, it's also geared towards minimizing the impacts of that kind of a mistake. Uh, another author has pointed out that it, it carries arbitrary parallel codes better than the vast majority of other genetic codes. And recent work in genetics has showed that the DNA doesn't just show how to code for proteins, but there's a lot of other information in there that's often overlaid. You have things overlaid in the same sequence that accomplish multiple purposes, which is very difficult to do through a blind, unguided process. And here's a slide that shows how well the genetic code minimizes errors among other ways that it could have been set up. If you're just choosing the genetic code at random, how you map from the codons into amino acids, if you were setting that up at random, you would expect this kind of a code error level, whereas the natural code is, is over here. And so some authors, when they first studied this, it looked like it was just a little optimized, but as they started adding in more analysis, it seemed to look more and more optimized over time. Um, one, one author says there's an eerie perfection, startling evidence of optimization. It's a one in a trillion level of optimization. Another article says it appears to be at or very close to a global optimum. It's the best of all possible codes. Now, I'm not sure I would go that far myself, but the fact that some people are considering it even as the best of all possible ones I find interesting. And the, the thing about this in particular is that it's very difficult to envision any kind of um, evolutionary process that could optimize the genetic code. Even Richard Dawkins admits this. He says any mutation in the code itself would have an instantly catastrophic effect, not just in one place, but throughout the whole organism. And the, the way to understand that is you could picture if you remap this keyboard so that every time you hit H, it really put T in or something like that, how does that disrupt your content of your message? It's going to really mess it up. And in the same way, if you start changing this code on an existing organism, um, it's going to be very difficult to make very significant changes without just messing it up. There seems to be sort of a negative selection of pressure there because even the simplest organism has hundreds of proteins. Each protein may average 100, 200, or more amino acids. So the odds of you being able to randomly change the code without making proteins worse is very low. Okay, so that's basically why Dawkins even admits that. It's why Francis Crick, Nobel Prize winner, discovered the structure of DNA. He called this a frozen accident. He didn't expect there to be optimization in the genetic code. When that was found later, that was very surprising because of this difficulty in evolving it. All right, so just flying through here for sake of time. You can also look at the fact that the genetic code seems to go back to our oldest organisms. We, it's not like we have really ancient bacteria with a totally different genetic code. There's a few variants. Those that exist seem to be suboptimal. Uh, the fact that it hasn't evolved in billions of years is also evidence supporting the claim I just made that it's difficult to evolve code. All right, so in summary, we've looked at different foundational areas of science and shown that there seems to be a reliance, if, if naturalism were true, there'd have to be a series of very improbable coincidences in order for there to be life. So the universe does look to be designed. There is strong evidence for design in cosmology, astronomy, particle physics, quantum physics, organic chemistry, physical chemistry, origin of life. Maybe the most controversial one I had on here was the origin of animal body plans. Um, but there really is no plausible theory there either, I think, to account for the Cambrian. And so uh, I think that overall, if you make this a cumulative case, it's a powerful case for design in the universe. And the really cool thing is that really only one of these dealt much at all with evolution, arguably two maybe, but the, the top eight there all deal with things that have to be true in the universe before any kind of biological evolution would even start. And so I argue that naturalism is built on a collapsed foundation. Daniel Dennett and others have argued that Darwinism is sort of a universal acid that eats away 
anything that could support design or belief in God. But I argue that that foundation itself is collapsed because Darwinian evolution presupposes the laws of physics being just right, the constants, all these other things that we've discussed, the origin of life, and all of those we have very strong design evidence for. So could these all be coincidences? I like this little clip here, if we can, having trouble somehow getting these to play except for that first one. Don't have sound there either. But you may have seen the Incredibles there. That's it's kind of funny. Are these coincidences? I think not. <laughs>